Okay, this is a video of possibilities of artistic peace building, a spiritual journey of connection and care that is being put on for the Chautauqua Institute um, this month. And I thought I would share this uh, recording for those who aren't able to be there. So I'm going to be looking at um, where this project came from and the heritage that it came from and what kind of heritage we're working from the college. Also, though, centering what is the heritage of the Chautauqua Institute, I'm going to be looking at how um, my project on podcasting has intersected also with the work of writing poetry and offering blessings, and maybe this move towards poetry and blessings as another form of artistic peace building. So I think we're going to kind of integrate all those things. So we're going to start out talking about the heritage we're going to use an example of Fred Rogers, because I think Fred Rogers helps any individual to be able to see what this peace building might actually look like in the flesh. And that's somebody who's really inspired us. And then some exploration of podcasts, some key lessons learned, and some blessings as we look at this three-part framework, um, mutuality, agency, and imagination. That three-part framework is going to be the guiding structure for most of this lecture. So I work at Elizabethtown College, and we work from an Anabaptist heritage of peace building. Um, from an article by Mary, I've chosen to kind of center these elements as the pieces of heritage that I want to live into and amplify. So this idea of lived theology or the embodied practice of peace, it's very different than like a theoretical version of peace or a kind of peace in which we think about just big peace treaties made between nations. We're actually more concerned about the lived day-to-day -day walk of peace. Intentional community, that we come together with others and we express direct intentions to be with each other. Presence and witness, and the Anabaptist heritage of witness as listening is really core uh, to what we've been thinking about with peace building. The violence of time, in a world that wants to move faster and faster and has uh, amazing high-speed electronic devices, there is a violence to our speed, and maybe there is a need to slow down and be present with each other. Uh, I could talk about peace building and peacemaking. I'm going to skip over that. Nonconformity and humility. So this idea that small acts of peace matter just as much as big acts matter. And also that we don't need to conform to the way in which the world thinks it needs to work. Sometimes we can challenge that and work outside of the structures of the world. And so we started this program at Elizabethtown College, a master of music education that I'm going to show you a picture of here in just a second, where we're actualizing this view of peace and we're actualizing it with music teachers. Some of the people who have the greatest capacity within schools to directly address the importance of social emotional learning and create feelings of belonging and bonding that can happen in public school environments. And from that, we centered on this phrase, reclaiming space for connection and care, that has been kind of the centering phrase for our master's program, that we exist here as music teachers to reclaim space for connection and care. I think that language of reclaim seems to be really important in an age after No Child Left Behind in which many teachers feel like they have had to give up this notion of connection and care to adapt to an age of accountability and education. And they're trying to reclaim that. And this speaks to the violence of our distraction and disconnection than cell phones. So core principles. So I wrote a book chapter a long time ago, Voices of Vocation, when I was trying to map out this heritage of peace building and centered on these three principles after reading a lot of literature on peace building. So mutuality, relationships are central and our being with each other is an act of peace building. Agency, this idea that when we offer each other the space to have a voice and a say in our lives, that that is an act of peacemaking. And then any act that takes away a person's voice, like slavery takes away a person's voice, is an act that is directly opposed to peace building. And so that you can think about it, the role of a music teacher in agency is incredibly powerful because the arts in many ways are a way of a person enlivening 
their sense of artistic voice. Then finally, imagination, this notion that peace can only happen when we take a look at what is and then imagine what could be. And another area where the arts are incredibly powerful is this act of imagination. And so we created musicpeacebuilding.com, uh, Reclaiming Space for Connection and Care is kind of the home for this digital work that we've been doing to bring peace builders together all across the world. And this is our latest cohort that we have in our master's program at Elizabethtown College, who just came together this past July. Um, and these are just amazingly gifted and passionate teachers who are committed to this notion of investing in social emotional learning, investing in notions like empathy and compassion within music classrooms to try and uh, insert an acts of peace as music educators and I dearly love them and admire so much of what they're doing out there in the world and here's the podcast logo so we're going to transition very gently and gradually into the podcasting work I started this podcast because I was looking for a way in which I would be able to communicate to people outside of E-Town what peace building was I would be able to live into the Anabaptist heritage of the lived walk of peace building. And you do that by interviewing people about their lived lives and how they're living out their calls as peace builders. And so that having that, and the other problem I was trying to solve is I didn't have any textbooks. Nobody's taught a master's program in music and peace building. And so bringing these voices together helps us to kind of capture some knowledge that are kind of like living textbooks that we can study as we study music and peace building. But first, let's look at what peace building might look like in the flesh. So I want to watch this video of Fred Rogers. Um, it's a dear video clip that I have of watching him work with this child who's in a wheelchair. And as you watch it, I want you to think about like, how is Fred Rogers expressing mutuality, agency, and imagination as he spends time with this child. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. Hi. Thank you very much for coming by. Can you tell my friends what it is that made you need this wheelchair? Sure. Well, when I was about seven months old, I had, um, I had a tumor and it broke the nerves to tell my hands and legs what to do. I see. And I got a wheelchair when I was four years old. That was your first one? Mm -hmm. When you were four? Uh-huh. He told Jeff before they started that they would have a chat and then sing a song together. I think he said we might sing a song. Yeah. I remember because yeah. I mean I was sort of surprised. What well, he's going to start singing a song? Well, you know, this is totally not even what song. <laughs> it's you, I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you, I like. The way you are right now. The way down deep inside you, not the things that hide you, not your fancy chair, <laughs> that's just beside you, but it's you I like, every part of you, your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether old or new. I hope that you remember even when you're feeling blue that it's you I like it's you yourself it's you it's you I like and it is you I like and there must be times when you do feel blue. Uh-huh. I'm not feeling blue right now, though. Me neither. <laughs> I'm so glad that you came today. Thanks. 
I remember asking one of the one of the staff people that was there. Well, you know, what do you think? Did it go okay? So, Don't. This is good. This is good. <laughs> he had his surgery. He survived. Certainly, Mr. Rogers had an impact on who Jeff became. His sense of self. Okay. So we asked this question, like, what does this clip speak to a lived theology of peacemaking and peace building and mutuality, agency, and imagination? And if I had a live audience here, I would ask you to reflect on some of these things. You know, and usually some of the things that come up, there is a sacredness in Fred Rogers getting down onto the level and looking directly into the eyes of Jeff, who's in the wheelchair. There is a sacredness about how they reach this point when they can't do anything else but sing together. And you can see that the singing is like a looking into each other and an imagination about it's you who I like and the genuine intention that's lived out there. And finally, agency, right? That um, Fred Rogers is sitting there and he is slowing down time and he is slowing down time so he can take the time to listen to what Jeff has to say. So there's so much that we could talk about, about this interaction that says peace. But let's move on. So moving from that, and I can't say enough about how Fred Rogers inspired me. I, I've watched some of his episodes and I've looked at how he slowed down time. And I've asked myself this question. If Fred Rogers was alive in 2022 and he was doing a podcast, what would he do? And I've tried to approach the podcast as if it is a slowing down of time. I try to read everything that, that whoever I'm interviewing has written before I get there because I want to honor and respect this individual and what they have to bring. And I try to find those kernels. What are the seeds and the kernels that are driving people in this work that they're doing? Uh, because these, these are all ways of honoring the people who I'm with. And I consider it to be such a, gr a gift each time I'm with somebody. And so after three years of work, here's a sampling of some of the people who I've interviewed over time. Uh, so many wonderful human beings who can all speak to issues of peace work and peace building and music education. I've interviewed songwriters. I've interviewed professional peace builders. I've interviewed world music drumming leaders. I've interviewed ethnomusicologists. I've interviewed um, Pratnatyam Indian dancers. Uh, a leader of a Brazilian musical arts. I've interviewed somebody who works in a, the prison system as a music educator. I've interviewed people who are advancing diversity, equity, inclusion in music. I've interviewed Sonia de los Santos, a great children's musician who's advancing Hispanic Latina uh, songs. And then this year, I've added more interviews like Sandeep Das in the lower left of the Silk Road Ensemble. Brent Talbot on Gamelon. I've been focusing on the Silk Roads. Ted Levin on um, Tuvan singing. Uh, Masayo Ishiguri on Koto playing in Japan. Uh, so many people here. Uh, you know, the Shakuhachi, Samonori, uh, Filipino peace building, just, Justice, Equity, Inclusion, Ikeda, uh, the great peace advocate from Japan. Um, was able to talk with Olivier about him. So anyway, that's where we are. So let's talk about agency and mattering. And may our voice and choice be held by the interdependence of listening. So here's an example. Um, Elizabeth Parker is doing beautiful work in research about how singing songs, especially within girls' choirs and women's choirs, may be songs of mattering, caring, and altruism. I think that because teachers give, like that's their, that is the teacher's life is to be a giver. If one is, if one is giving kind of in that, in that one caring uh, capacity, then that is, that's likely going to be something that you engender in other people, which is awesome. Like that's, that's, that to me is, I mean, that's the reason to be a teacher and the reason to, to keep doing it is uh, to know that that's. You were listening. Okay, and from this, I get questions like, what does it mean to care? What does it mean to belong? And how do you hold caring and belonging within the space of agency? Sonia de los Santos and the joy of musical voice, one of my great heroes. She puts out so many beautiful songs of children's music. I 
like to find their voices. Isn't that like the the best thing that could happen to kids? You know, in a time where I don't know. You know, I just want people to to find happiness in who they are and to feel empowered to be proud of who they are and to be able to talk about it without feeling scared or feeling uh, less than anyone else. You were listening to. So she talks about being someone just across the border in Monterrey, Mexico, and what it means uh, to give a child a voice and a spirit of playfulness, both through Hispanic songs and English songs. How might we adopt a spirit of playfulness in resolving and transforming conflicts? What seems to be the interrelationship between joy, voice, and imagination? And I'm going to start introducing. So. In the spirit of Chautauqua, I have written poems at the, at the end of many of these podcasts. To, and I, I do it as a challenge myself. I say, if I was to take this person's ideas and language, and if I was to try and write a brief poem at the end of the podcast to summarize and invest in what this person is about, what, how would I start to write a poem to that effect? And so here is a blessing in the spirit of John O'Donohue. Inspired by the lines from Sonia's songs. May our adventurous spirits find the lush green hills of Monterey. May our journeys, our migrations, be wings of discovery on the wind of hope and warm breezes of home and family. And joy. May we find the light of our inner child that crows our hearts to the sunrise, our dreams to the wind, our love over rivers of playfulness. May we fly on the voice of song. For more on the music of Sonia de los Santos, you can find... Okay, so that's me bringing together a lot of her ideas. I've also had the opportunity to interview Dr. Bridget Moix, who's um, worked Moy, sorry, who's worked a lot with um, the Quaker approach to peace building. And she wrote this new book, Choosing Peace, Agency and Action in the Midst of War. And she's advocating for a shift in peace building toward locally led peace building. And here's a final blessing to that podcast. And it starts with a really beautiful bluegrass recording where a bluegrass band is intersecting with another group within... The center of Africa. I'm so sorry, I forget which country that this is taking place in. Or Ugandan community, sorry. Now I can read it. May our lives be filled with the multiplier effect of hope and joy as we open space for new voices to hold agency for peace. Special thanks to Dr. Bridget Moix for Okay, imagination. So here's just a sample of a few podcasts that have spoken to imagination for me. So I spent time with Dr. Mary Cohen, um, who is doing beautiful work, and she took um, making music within prison contexts, um, out of her ethical concern for inmates, she calls them insiders rather than inmates. So I'm going to use that language here. And the use of choral singing, uh, how is it a, an act of empowerment for marginalized communities in a way of finding voice? And maybe most importantly, an imagination of possible selves. So when we have wronged somebody or when we've caused harm, how might we imagine a better sense of ourself? And music is maybe asking that question, and maybe songwriting is asking that. Good afternoon. My Here's name a is uh, a beautiful Rod. recording Most from you guys know me as a -Rod. an insider talking about a song. Earlier, you heard Macy speak of the Native American tribes who once called Iowa home. I am an enrolled member of one of these tribes. In this choir, we sing from a variety of perspectives, not always aligning. For example, the next song makes me uncomfortable. I know firsthand the depths 
people will go to to attain their perfect peace. However, I'm beginning to understand the humility it takes to build bridges of peace. It's with this in peace in mind that we sing the following song. Okay, it's a really powerful quote. What are redemptive and restorative approaches to justice? How does music open imaginations of possible selves? Okay, next one. Narratives of trauma and transcendent hope with Tanae Angela Freeman. Tanae is going to be on the E-Town campus this February to do a concert and maybe even a, a, some book readings from her recent novel, The Sky is Deeper Than the Sea. Her beautiful creative work talks, it, it, it investigates notions of trauma, racialized trauma in the United States and the notion of the transcendent hope. And her novel in particular follows the great migration north and with, uh, in, within the tradition of magical realism in a series of flashbacks, she is working on writing to her imagination of how trauma might be transcended. When we decide that we're going to operate from a place of hopefulness and believing that tomorrow can be better than today, it gives us the power to display acts of radical mercy. It gives us the power to continue creating, to continue being loving. And I think art is one of the ways that we can paint these pictures of hope. So for me, all of it was my attempt to point in the direction of hope, transcendent hope. You were listening. Okay, some questions. She describes listening as an improvisatory act, a sense of listening for what comes next. What does it mean for listening to be an improvisatory act? What is the role of transcendent hope in healing trauma and building new, compassionate realities? Next podcast, uh, interview with Marta Gonzalez, uh, who's done some gorgeous work in the Los Angeles area. And she is, she's um, been Grammy nominated for her work with Quetzal. Uh, and their work on the Son Jurocho uh, musical genre, which has been a really interesting genre to pay attention to because of the ways in which fandango is used to advance notions of community and also to challenge structures like the border wall at the United States-Mexican border. Uh, there's the ritual of playing fandangos um, at the border with people f from both the Mexico and the United States side making music together across the chasm of the border. How are you going to influence with dignity? How are you going to, without really imposing your thought or your own aesthetic onto the practice? As a musician who loves to do this and values songwriting, how can I be a good facilitator, but also a good instigator? finding ways of, of influencing also thought and getting people to not alienate people that you don't agree with, but trying to find ways of, of, of also including them in this dialogue that you may not change their mind in that instant, but you might influence them or plant a seed in such a way that walking away and humming to that song that they help write make, gives them an aha moment and says, I've been wrong. You are listening to the Across history, many have imagined superior races, pure people, or a great nation that led to genocide, slavery, or colonization. How have our imaginations led to violence or destructive tendencies? Working from the model of Fandango Frantorizo, what can, when can imagination become liberatory? How might liberatory imagination be constructed in community? And here's a blessing from that podcast. There have also been moments of hope. Music in this sense was inspiring, a conduit of freedom and a malleable tool for those who envision social change. These moments in particular have allowed me to see how music could be a liberatory process, a deliberate act of love, and a source of empowerment for self and community. A poem taken from words and inspirations from this conversation. May we have a convivencia of dreams, opening worlds, rejecting erasure, 
were the names of things, lean on the thread of relation, holding the breath of connection. Where our desire for more says no more. As heels of protest hammer the tarima against the disconnection of our being. May dreams surpass the harshest barbed wire, bending to sadness, standing tall for loving, and sculpt and mold new voices, new imaginations of relation. Special thanks to Marta Gonzalez. Okay, and that last section about bending and standing tall was taken directly from the lyrics of some of the women who wrote pieces with Marta Gonzalez to empower women's voices within, I think, Mexico City as she was doing songwriting workshops there. Embodied poetry of ritual and symbol and transformative space, Lisa Shirk is one of the pioneering leaders in the field of peace building. That includes you in this in this interview, so I'm grateful that you're interested in this and you're exploring it, and I look forward to hearing more of your podcasts to learn what you're doing. Special thanks to Dr. Lisa Shirk for her time and scholarship. Links to her publications and website can be found on our podcast website at musicpeacebuilding.com. If you are as fascinated as I am by symbol and ritual, I highly recommend her text on ritual and symbol in peacebuilding, as well as other music education, peacebuilding, and anthropology texts that will be listed on our website. As we close this first season of our podcast, I close with a blessing taken from the thoughts of Dr. Lisa Shirk. May you enter a rainbow and hold the blessing of symbol, transforming sun-soaked water droplets into beginnings and thresholds, transforming smoke into reminders to seek best intentions. May you dance to music transforming metered time into rituals of shared being. May we honor joy, happiness, pain, and grief, bearing violence and fear, and giving birth to love. May we signify the dance of our time together. Listeners, it has been a joy and a pleasure to spend time Okay, and finally, mutuality and relation. Um, I think that being at Chautauqua is important to talk about ecological care, because in this beautiful space that we have with these trees. Uh, And Dan Shivak has been one of my uh, beloved scholars who's been out at the forefront of talking about eco-literate music education. A lot of actual diversity in the world when it comes to cultural and musical diversity has to do with traditions being held by somebody. And where we in the West have uprooted ourselves, rerooting ourselves and refinding those old traditions where we can. You are listening to the Music and Peace Building Pod. Does our sense of ecological care and being change as we live into local forms of being? How does learning to hear ecological soundscapes and the rich diversity of sounds change our sense of being, caring, and belonging? So in many ways, he's asking children to, to leave the walls of the classroom and go outside and listen to the soundscapes that are within the natural world and reclaim that sound. And here's a blessing. May we all sow deep roots that curl and hold with the diversity of our mutual being, musicking into ecological being, sounding radiant sunrise or symphonies of inner silence. Um, A follow-up podcast from this season, Sounding Tuvan Hospitalities of Place. Uh, Tuvan singing has long inspired me for the relation to the natural world. The very idea that you would sit beside a creek and you would listen to that creek and then you would sing back to it and try to imitate it with your voice. How people understand, culturally speaking, who they are gives them the material they need and, and the sense of selfhood 
to become pluralist, to become interested in the culture of others, and to feel that they can be at once rooted and empathetic. You are listening to Season 3, and a blessing from the end of it. As we close this episode, I embrace a love of poetry that is so deeply held in Central Asia, constructing a poem from the ideas in this podcast. When we find ourselves in the company of roaring waters, nearby creeks, the poetry of leaves in the wind, may you wrap your arms, embracing sounds to enter the marrow of your being. Pull closer. We are in sacred space. The hospitality of here. Let us sing to this place and listen. Sing and listen until exchange entwines, coloring our impermanence in pressing necessities of relation. May we sing and listen songs that caress, weave, embrace, tangles of care, winding roads across mountains, rivers, caves, valleys to a presence of being here. Okay, and I think because time is getting away on this video, I'm going to skip over this one for now. Um, changing spaces for peace building in Filipino contexts. Uh, this one in particular has been really powerful because it's looked at the tentacling dance and how the tentacling dance might be a metaphor for peace building within the Philippines. And I'm so honored to hold these stories and share these stories. And which is why each one of them said, please give our real name. We are real people. These are our stories. And so I, it was a labor of love to say, here are voices that other people should hear and not just me. <laughs> so that's the origins of this project. So I'll just add that piece. Craker closes a chapter with the note. Given the voices that I have listened to for this project, I have come to believe that peacebuilding must be lodged within the discussions of transforming structural violence, conversations of root causes, and all oriented toward a potential for human flourishing. Local actors need to emerge as the prime contributors to perspectives essential for sustainable peace platforms. I reflect on the power of dance and metaphor to reform space and inhabit a retutoring of the body as we sway and bend, forever being formed and changed while held by the shared roots of community. May we collapse endless cycles of harm, unweaving looms of colonial thinking, reforming spaces that collapse distance and weave strands of relation, and allow ears, our mouths, our bodies, our beings, to retutor us, dancing tentacling steps, paths, and a bamboo swaying to the inner nudges of the moment. Dr. Wendy Craker's book, Multidimensional... Okay, so she's speaking a lot. The bamboo is a metaphor in this... And I think one thing that really inspires me about tentacling dance and the, that picture in the lower left is that it is a model in which people move in a circle and they're tightly focused on the dancers in the center. And that sense of attention on each other is something that seems to break through our colonial cycles of trying to own each other and to dominate each other. Instead, art creates a space where mutuality has to take place. Okay, and this is, I think this is the final one. This has been my most popular podcast, the one that's had the most listens, on restoring women and ethics of care through Indian dance. Uh, so, so Suryoshi Day is taking this dance style, the Pratnatyam dance style, from the Odissi style of classical Indian dance, and she's taking minor female characters and reinscribing the story such that an indigenous female character might have a greater sense of voice. Ah, 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 ah,
May we enter the fullness of our lived experience, crying out on Yukrosha into the full empathetic experience of our relations. May our footsteps be turned by love toward uncertain but no less worthy acts of care. May our stories claim the fullness of our worth, the integratedness of our relations, and when stories do not, may we restory, storying marginalized shadows into fully human beings. Okay. And we're encountering the next work, which is Silk Roads of Peace. We're going to be teaching a course this fall on Silk Roads of Peace. So we'll be going through cultures within Japan, China, Central Asia, India, um, Persia, Iran, um, Iraq, um, Islamic cultures, and looking at how, what kind of uh, wisdoms and expertise do these cultures hold for peace building. And that's been kind of our work this past year. And I think I close with some of these questions about like, what does it mean to sit with voices and allow those voices to change us? Particularly as I moved to Japan and in Ikeda, and looking at the tradition of dialogue that is there, and this notion that dialogue, you should enter a dialogue first with the intention of being changed rather than the intention of expressing yourself. And I can say for myself that spending all these hours on three years of podcast has changed me, and it's made an impact about how I express and understand musical and artistic peace building. So with that, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope that you've gained something about this notion of music and peace building and how artistic peace building offers different kinds of possibilities for peace work that go beyond the talk, and they offer ways through mutuality, agency, and imagination.